Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Karima, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the Midwest Women in Cardiology for the kind invitation. Uh, I'm going to be talking today a little bit about peripartum cardiomyopathy. We are going to review the normal changes for pregnancy and then talk a little more about peripartum cardiomyopathy. So normally in pregnancy, uh, you have an increase in blood volume, which is much higher than the increase in RBC mass, which leads to what we call as the physiological anemia of pregnancy. And most of these changes happen in the second and third trimester. At the same time, there's a significant increase in the stroke volume, along with a mild increase in heart rate, and both of these contribute to significant increase in cardiac output, again happening in the second and the third trimester. Because of these changes, there are significant uh, changes in the cardiovascular exam during pregnancy, which differ from the regular patient. And 95% of the patients can have a systolic murmur. A loud S3 is normal and increased volume status leads to brisk and full carotid upstrokes, displaced and enlarged apex, along with varicose veins and edema. The definition of peripartum cardiomyopathy involves a heart failure towards the end of pregnancy or in the months following delivery. So in the last trimester or in the first six months after delivery, the first six months postpartum, is if you have any uh, cardiac heart failure without any identifiable cause. So this is idiopathic cardiomyopathy of pregnancy and the EF has to be less than 45% for diagnosis. Even though it's the last trimester and the first six months, you can see the incidence is highest in the few months immediately after the delivery, and that's the highest incidence at the time. Multiple risk factors, the most common are uh, African-American patients or elderly patients. Also increased number of pregnancies or multiple fetuses increase the risk, along with the traditional risk factors of hypertension, diabetes, and so on. The pathophysiology is uh, unclear at this time. There's multiple possible explanations, but nothing verified. Diagnosis is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to exclude other etiologies before you label it as peripartium cardiomyopathy. And echo is the mainstay with the low ejection fraction. Along with regular workup, endomyocardial biopsy can be considered if, they, if it is felt it could be a giant cell myocarditis or something significant. Again, differential diagnosis. Remember the pre-existing cardiac lesions, which can become manifest during pregnancy. Most of this happened in the second trimester, but pre-existing cardiomyopathy, valve diseases, hypertensive heart disease, uh, non-compaction, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, all these need to be considered in the differential diagnosis. The management depends on the severity of presentation in a, if they're in cardiogenic shock. You manage them accordingly with optimizing preload, oxygenation, and so on. Urgent delivery can be considered along with consideration for use of mechanical or circular support or even transplantation if needed. If they are stable and in the antepartum period, heart failure therapy mainly centers on hydralazine, nitrates, and beta blockers. Diuretics can be considered, but remember diuretics can decrease the placental perfusion. So dose regulation is important here. Delivery is mostly vaginal as long as it's reasonably stable. And in the postpartum period, the management is dependent if they're breastfeeding or not. ACEs, beta blockers, and mineralocorticoid are kind of considered not uh, are considered reasonable in the postpartum period, especially if the patient is not breastfeeding. Bromocryptine is an agent which can be considered in acute heart failure or long term, but this is mostly used in the, uh, Europe. In the United States, we are still evaluating this therapy. Remember that if the patients use bromocryptin, there is a higher risk of uh, clotting, so anticoagulation needs to be considered. Again, the medications with heart failure, metoprolol, carvedilol, and the diuretics are reasonably safe as long as we are mindful about the doses during pregnancy. Contraindicated in pregnancy are ACEs, ARBs, aldosterone antagonists, as we just talked. Early delivery is not required as long as the maternal and fetal conditions are stable and most patients can safely be delivered vaginally. Advanced heart failure is one indication where prompt delivery can be considered. Postpartum breastfeeding, as long as the patient is not breastfeeding, then you do standard guideline directed medical therapy, but this should not be a reason to discourage women from breastfeeding. 
If they are breastfeeding, beta blockers and a lateral and spironolactone are felt to be compatible. And a lateral and spironolactone can appear in the breast milk, uh, but the doses are very small and felt to be reasonably safe. ARBs, neprilysin inhibitors, and ivabridine do not have inflammation and should not be used. So how do these people do in follow-up? And the prognosis is dependent mainly on their presenting ejection fraction. As long as the ejection fraction is less than 30%, their prognosis is much worse, and this is the presentation EF, their prognosis is much worse than the, than the patients whose ejection fraction is greater than 30%. So this is one of the studies which had, studied, which had followed these patients. And uh, if the EF is less than 30% or their endoscopic dimension is less than 60 millimeters, their prognosis is worse than the others. Even if the EF improves, there's a risk of 20% risk of heart failure and 10% risk of death in this patient population, which doubles in the patients whose EF does not improve. So EF less than 25% at presentation or persistent decrease in EF are contraindications to further pregnancy or the patient needs to understand the risk of worsening clinical status significantly. So to review, we talked about the cardiovascular changes in normal pregnancy. Predominantly in the second and third trimester, there's an increased volume status, increased heart rates, increased blood volume. And we talked about the definition of peripartum cardiomyopathy in the third trimester or in the first six months after the incidence being highest in the first two months immediately after delivery. We talked about pathophysiology, not entirely clear what happens here. We talked about risk factors, elderly patients, African-Americans, multiple pregnancy, multifetal, and traditional risk factors. These are the highest risk patients. We talked about diagnosis where echo is the mainstay and the differential diagnosis is multiple, mainly pre-existing cardiac disease. So this is uh, idiopathic cardiomyopathy of pregnancy. So we need to exclude other etiologies before we label the patient as peripartum cardiomyopathy. Management depends on if they are uh, pregnant or if they are breastfeeding or in which stage that the, the patient is. And uh, they remember the drugs which are contraindicated during pregnancy, especially the ACEs, the ARBs and the mineralocorticoids and be mindful about using diuretics at this time. Prognosis depends on how the rejection fraction was at pregnancy and initially on presentation and how the rejection fraction did on follow-up and that should guide further management. Thank you all very much for your time and your kind attention.